the panel discussion will be chaired by Professor Jafar Jafari on my right, Professor Eduardo Fayasola, Professor Abraham Pazim, Mr. Ron Harris, and Professor Fevzi Okomus. I'll introduce each of the, each of the, the panel, uh, and, uh, and then I'll hand over to Jafar. Professor Jafar Jafari is the founding editor of Annals of Tourism Research, chief editor of Tourism Social Science, the book series, co-chief editor of Bridging Tourism Theory and Practice, the book series, chief editor Encyclopedia of Tourism, co-founding editor of Information Technology and Tourism. Jafar is the co-founding president of International Academy for the Study of Tourism. Jafar has received the 2005 United Nations World Tourism Organization Ulysses Award. Jafar, welcome. Professor Eduardo Fayez Sola will address the topic of tourism, economics. Eduardo is the president of the Ulysses Foundation and professor of applied economics and tourism policy at the University of Valencia. In studying his resume, you'll be impressed by his passion for education, knowledge, and quality in tourism. He's a researcher and author and has received the Knight of the Order of Civil Merit of Spain. Eduardo has enjoyed various United Nations responsibilities and has filled the position of Director General of Tourism for Spain in the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Tourism. Eduardo, welcome. <laughs> Professor Abraham Pazim, Pizam, I apologize. Abraham is the Dean Linda Chaplin, eminent scholar chair in tourism management and director of the Dick Pope Senior Institute for Tourism Studies at the Rosen School of Hospitality Management at the University of Central Florida. Abraham is well known in the field of hospitality and tourism management, having conducted research and consulted in over 30 countries. Abraham has authored 10 books and is on the editorial teams of 21 periodicals. Abraham, Abraham has conducted consulting and research projects for a variety of tourism agencies, national tourism offices, hotels, theme parks, tour operators, airlines, and professional tourism associations. Abraham, welcome. Mr. Harris Rosen will address the issue of international convention centres. Harris is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Rosen Hotels and Resorts. He started his career as a convention salesman. Recently, he was listed in the Forbes magazine as the 30th most generous, generous philanthropist in America. His legacy includes donating the ground to the University of Central Florida and founding the Rosen College of Hospitality Management, which has grown from 75 students to 3,000 in six years. He's uplifted communities through the establishment of scholarships, preschools, and community centers. Harris said to me yesterday that giving back is a responsibility that business should embrace seriously. What Harris is best known for is his hotel chain and convention center. The collective numbers, rooms on offer at the hotels are 6,500, in other words it, seats 13, 000, it sleeps 13,000 people, and the conference centers um, in total seat over 50,000. Harris, welcome. Professor Fevzi Okumus will address us on the regional competitiveness, a cluster approach. 
Fevzi, this is the serious topic, not the one we spoke about last night. Fevzi is currently the Chair of Hospitality Services Department at the Dean College of Hospitality Management. Fevzi is an editor and serves on 10 editorial boards. His expertise lies in strategic planning, implementation, competitive advantage, knowledge management, crisis management, cross-cultural management, and destination marketing. Fevzi, welcome. At this stage, I'll hand over to Jafar. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with this audience, a large audience. Uh, this is my second visit to South Africa. We people in, in tourism say only repeaters tell the true story. If they come back, it means they have liked what they have enjoyed before. Uh, I'm going to reduce the uh, pleasantries in order to get to, to the subject which is assigned to us. I would like to begin by saying that we have had excellent sessions yesterday and this morning, and I'm sure you agree with, with me. But now the task which is assigned to us is to benefit from what we have heard in order to come up with a discussion on the strategies that would benefit Mombella uh, for the purpose of tourism development. To begin with, we heard the Executive Mayor, Delamini, MEC Mokenel, and Dr. Mambunda, and they all gave us a lot of food for thought. For example, uh, our mayor, uh, Executive Mayor told us that, the, uh, that there would be a mandate to create an environment for economic opportunity. She reminded us of partnership with the stakeholders. She noted that platform for continuous engagement is necessary. She encouraged involvement of local business in local life. And she and other speakers also spoke about regional development and cooperation and much, much more. Executive Mayor was very enthusiastic with her remarks, which reminded me of a visit I had with another mayor. That was in the city of Valencia with Dr. Uh, Eduardo Faisola together. And I saw the same enthusiasm in both of them. She was really, the uh, Valencia mayor was really committed to tourism. She wanted to talk to Eduardo and I to suggest ways that Valencia would benefit more from tourism. And if and when it benefits more from tourism, she wanted this to improve the quality of life for Valencianos. It was a very interesting visit. We, we were supposed to have a 30-minute visit with her. It ended up to be almost three hours. Uh, this is the kind of enthusiasm that a mayor needs to have for tourism to happen. If a, if a mayor is not behind tourism, it wouldn't happen. So I, I've come across two mayors who are really committed to the spirit and the possibilities that tourism can offer. The breakout sessions were really excellent. Uh, 
we had, I went to one of them, and I'm sure you went to some other ones as well. Yesterday we were in the car, and the same people are sitting here, including, including Ron, we were talking about one point, and that is the questions that they were raised from the audience were informed questions. It's rare to come across an audience who really, really understand the subject. And we were really impressed with the questions that were raised during all the breakout sessions. And that gave us all the inspirations for the presentation that we are going to have. So it's ideas from you to ask back to you. Uh, we came up, you, you see already the, uh, the title we selected for it. Uh, who we are, this is you, not us, you. Who we are, where are we going, with which strategies, and with what means. Building the future in ten and a half steps. The subtitle is the proposal from Eduardo Faisola. The topics we have selected for you are infrastructure and superstructure that Mombella or any destination needs to have. A number of questions directly spoke to uh, the uh, existence or lack of existence of some of these um, ways and means of tourism. Uh, the strategic positioning, uh, also in reference to image for Mobella and South Africa. I have asked a couple of, a few South Africans uh, in the audience randomly what do you think comes to the, to the minds of the tourists outside of South Africa when, hear, when they hear the name South Africa? And I didn't really get a, an immediate answer. So what is that image that is, needs, it's going to be broadcast? Thank you. This, sure, that is much better. You're also a good engineer. Thank you. Yes, I see this way. All right, very good. The next one is entrepreneurship. Uh, things will not happen unless we make the move, individually and then collectively. The spirit of hospitality needs to be in the person. Call that person an investor, a policymaker, uh, an employee of hotel or tourism. It, it helps, but of course, it, it, it's crucial actually, but it's much more crucial for those who are building, uh, investing and in building the destination. Participative tourism policy and governance. No destination has ever succeeded without any policy. A policy that governs the destination and directs the destination and everybody uh, knows about those policies. Knowledge management. Four of us sitting here are uh, individuals ha who have spent ent our entire life in, in education, research, and scholarship. And we confirm here that there's a body of knowledge there. We know a lot about tourism. Some of that we have discovered by doing research on, and some of that we know from the mistakes that have been made. And many mistakes have been made. And the reason that mistakes have been made, no policy, no understanding, no planning, no strategy. Let's do, everybody has done tourism and succeeded, we can do it too. Well, that wouldn't work. Education and training. Coming from us here, the educators sitting here and educators there, tourism begins with education and training. It is impossible to have a destination which is successful and people are not trained for it. As simple as that. Sometimes we fail to recognize this point. Imagine building a hospital, a fantastic hospital, with the best surgery equipment, the best facility, no doctors, no nurses. 
And sometimes our fancy hotels are victim of the same situation. The investors invest all the money, now they look around, where do we get the people to, to make it go? But whenever we are talking about service and quality of service, it is coming from the training and education. I have to make one more point here. The problem is that sometimes the industry considers education as an expense, training as an expense. It is not. It is investment. Quality standards including sanitation. What sort of quality standards are we for, going for? And in the mind of the tourist, some of the countries may not meet the standard levels. Right or no, wrong doesn't matter. If they think it's not there, then it's not there. So we need to have standards, quality standards. The spirit of hospitality is something that is often neglected. The willingness to receive, accommodate, and serve people. In this case, not just the hospitality and tourism employees, but the community. The community must be for tourism. No hostile community would provide environment for success in tourism. Safety and security, an issue which is universal, spreads throughout the world. Some countries have more of it, lack of it, or have it, and some countries less of it. I recall uh, UNWTO General Assembly that we had in Colombia, a country that has terrible reputation when it comes to safety and security. And the president was there all, all along during the assembly to show that this is a safe country. And he even asked his Minister of Tourism to stand up and say, would you please give your cell phone number to the audience? If they have any problem, they should call you. Nothing, nothing happened. 1,000 people were participating. Nothing, absolutely nothing happened to anybody was not reported, anything that we could know. So what I'm saying that safety and security could be real, but it could be also inflated. Of course, there are areas in Colombia that the tourists would not dare to go and perhaps should not go. Quality of life in Mombela community. I've come up with a, a new theme that I'm advocating. I've written a, a number of things about it. I call, I, I call it a nice place to live is a nice place to visit. Have you ever come across a nice place a place which is not nice to, to live, but it is very pleasant to visit. It just doesn't happen. I think our mayor also, executive mayor also reminded us, quality of life for Mombela. If the standard of quality of life for the citizen of a territory, of a nation, of a country, Im improves by your tourism, mm -hmm. tourism has a better chance. Yes, I studied hotel management and tourism management, but I also studied anthropology. My last degree is in anthro cultural anthropology. And my, my issue is, why do we do tourism? And my answer is, we do tourism to benefit the community. If we don't have that idea in mind, why would Mombela want to do tourism? To benefit Mombela and its citizens. And ten and a half contribution from Eduardo. Thinking together and acting together, which goes to the beginning of the issue and it goes to issue of entre entrepreneurship, to a number of issues connecting together. We really have to work together in every destination. That is the the problem is the tourism industry is so sector sectorialized. Hotel people together, restaurant people, airline people, transportation people, agencies. We are one industry, and we all have to work together. So this is the topics that we are going to talk about. Uh, Mark, 
uh, uh, yesterday impressed us with uh, very nice quotations, so I borrowed the idea from him. And I want to quote John F. Kennedy before we begin the discussion. John F. Kennedy said in his inauguration speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Let me par paraphrase that. Ask not what Mombela can do for you, ask what you can do for Mombela. That is the spirit we would like to have in the audience. What can I do to make a difference, rather than waiting for Mombela to open all, all the doors? And I, again, uh, just for your sake, uh, Mark, another quotation. Future is not where we are going, it is what we are building. So with these ideas in mind, we are going to go to these topics. We are going to have a dialogue among us. Uh, one person may begin, another person may come into the same subject, and we move on to the second and the third and all, all the way to the tenth. And hopefully, well definitely, we are going to save some time for you people to ask questions. So I invite my colleagues here, any one of you to talk on number one, infrastructure and superstructure. Can we perhaps speak a little bit each about, about each? Uh, about how do we save them? Okay, okay, sure. Yes, thank you, Efar. Um, some 30 years ago, this is a message of hope, professional, individual hope, and collective hope. Some 30 years ago, I was a graduate student. I was working for my PhD in a less developed country. A less developed country was called Spain 30 years ago. And I got a scholarship from the government of Sweden to write my dissertation in Sweden. I did not touch tourism. My dissertation was on economics of development and policies. Um, I became a diplomat, a career diplomat. And some years later, someone said, well, this country, Spain, is doing well with tourism. Why don't you get in tourism? Why don't you become the director of tourism for Spain? And we were facing the Olympics, and we were facing the World Expo in Seville. And I had a very nice and comfortable career in science, technology, advising my government for science and technology as a career diplomat. I was in London, Stockholm, and other nice places. I said, well, this, this sounds tough, but interesting. And I made my choice. I made my professional choice that to shift careers from science and technology to tourism. And my country, I think, also made a choice that tourism was the thing that was working as a tool, as an instrument for developing in Spain. Now, 30 years later, I'm happy that I made that kind of choice, and I think that my country is also happy that we made that kind of choice. Spain is now a developed country with many problems, but a developed country, and I'm very happy that I had a full professional life, and I'm having a full professional life with tourism. So it's a message of hope that if you really, as Jafar, Professor Jafari said, if you really bet for tourism, you got it. Now, this is interesting, but the issue is how to do it, how to do it. And I say that in, in my career, first in charge of uh, tourism in Spain, this is 57 million tourists a year, 55, 7, 57. And then in the United Nations, in the United Nations World Tourism Organization, where supposedly I was in charge of supervising thinking and strategy for the whole global tourism. That's about, as you know very well, 950 million tourists. So it's an interesting responsibility, which made me lose a lot of hair, very little left. <laughs> I, I think that the important thing is first to have the commitment. Do you really want to do this? Is Bombela going to bet on tourism? Is this going to be the right way, among other things, of course, but is it going to be a main thrust for development in Bombela? Is it going to be tourism? No jokes about it. If you go for it, you really have to bet on it. And the second part is do it professionally. To have a good idea, to have an inspiration overnight, a good dream, this is important. But then you have to put it into a methodical action. And I said, and I'll finish with this, do two things. To work in, policy, in, in tourism policy, to do things in tourism, you have to do two things. Number one, to be able to analyze and understand what is the complex tourism system. Tourism is not so simple as it looks. Tourism cuts in a transversal way about many activities, many, many things we do normally. So first, understand and analyze. Once you're there, now say, where would we want to go and how do we go there? And I think that 
the online ten and a half chapters. Julian Barnes wrote a book, The History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters. And Jafar today proposes that we study uh, development in, through tourism in ten and a half steps. So thank you very much. Uh, let me start addressing the uh, issues that were brought up uh, in this uh, demonstration. Uh, it is insufficient to have a wonderful idea or to have some natural or man-made resources or even have the finances to create a great tourist destination. The first item that you see before you there says infrastructure and superstructure. And I would like to demonstrate the great importance that these have for the development of a tourist destination. Ron Logan, in his previous uh, address, said something about my passion, which is space tourism. I may have been born in the wrong uh, time. I may be coming back in the future, but I have a dream, to paraphrase Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King. And my dream is to see space tourism within our times, within my lifetime. Now, I will demonstrate very easily to you that without the infrastructure and superstructure necessary to accommodate men and women in space, this great idea will never materialize. First, we need a vehicle to take the people from Earth into space. We need a vehicle that will bring that at a reasonable cost. So that's the infrastructure. Second, we need a place where men can stand or sit or s sleep, and that is the superstructure a space station. So without those two, space tourism will never exist. And it did not exist until now because we don't have the infrastructure at superstructure at the appropriate cost. The same is true here for any tourist destination on Earth. You have to have the accessibility to that and you have to have the means of accommodating the tourists, which is the superstructure, the hotels, the restaurants, the facilities, the telecommunication, water, electricity, and on and on and on. So the first requirement of any great tourist destination to exist is have the proper infrastructure and superstructure. By doing that, we understand that these do not occur in a vacuum. They occur within an existing place where you have those or you build them at the proper cost. I was uh, trying to pass the baton to the other professor because I was going to let the professors <laughs> talk first in a very, you know, organized and methodical way, as professors do. <clears throat> and then I was going to raise my hand as the sort of the business person, the entrepreneur, and say whatever I wanted to say. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that we're talking about infrastructure and superstructure. I understand infrastructure. I'm not so sure I understand superstructure. But let me share this with you. When Walt Disney came to Orlando in the late 1960s and flew over Orlando, you know what he saw? Citrus trees. Do you know what the county is called in Central Florida? Orange County. Not Disney County. Not Tourist County. Orange County. But you see, 
and I'm not comparing myself with Walt, who is an extraordinary person and a genius, but people like me, the first thing we do is dream. Dream. Without a dream, you can't even get to the starting line. So you dream. Walt had a dream, and that's what motivated him. I had a dream, and that's what motivated me. So yes, you do need roads, and you do need water, and you do need electricity, and you do need a sewer system, and you do need a safe and secure environment. Yes, that's true. But if you don't have someone or some bodies with a dream, you're not going to get very far. So on this very distinguished panel, you will hear a lot of very important information. And then you will hear me talking about how we started our little company and what we did to see our little company grow. But it all started with a dream. And let me share this with you. Mr. Logan was talking about his esteemed career at Disney. He's going to get angry with me for saying this, but I started in Orlando working for Disney as Winnie the Pooh. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, before I start my presentation, they all have Professor Jafari, Eduardo, Dean Pizam, and Mr. Rosen. They have so many experience and so many stories to tell. I said, being a relatively a junior uh, academic compared to them and compared to Mr. Rosen, I better prepare a presentation so I can put uh, all the attendees in sleep. Okay. But before I start my, present, my uh, speech, I want to provide two definitions of a, a professor. Perhaps you haven't heard this. A professor is someone who makes simple things very complicated <laughs> with formulas and theories and statistics and numbers and confuses everyone. Okay. And the second definition is a professor is someone who can speak about the same topic in explain the same topic in one minute five minutes one hour one semester and one year or the whole his life okay. so so my area is strategic management I live with it. It doesn't work at home with my wife and my daughters, but it's partly working at the Rosen College and when I run my journal, uh, the, the International Journal of Contemporary Hospitality Management and my academic studies, but it has not worked so far well at home. The best strategy is just follow my wife's orders, so that is the best strategy. Today we will we will together, all together, discuss competitiveness, competitive advantage. When I start discussing in classes, I first start with, an, with a question. Now I'm asking you the same question. What is your competitive advantage? I want you to write down your personal competitive advantage, including our panel. And I will collect. What is your competitive advantage? 
the first question, please write down. Second question is, the company you are working for, what is the company's competitive advantage? And then the region, what, the, what is the competitive advantage of the region that you live in, you work? And you will get a pass or fail uh, grade for these uh, based on your answers. And I'm a tough professor. So the first question is, what is your competitive advantage? What is the company's uh, organization's competitive advantage that you work for? And the, the third question, what is the competitive advantage of the region, municipality, or the nation, the country you live in? You have 30 seconds. I think we can start. I will collect your answers after our uh, panel discussion and then email back you your grades, okay? Uh, but I will make sure I fly first to, to Orlando. Unless if I fail you, there may be some complications. Anyway, when we discuss competitiveness for a destination, for a company, we we'll look at how this destination this region uses its resources. It's all about productivity. How a region uses its resources, how productively. It's all about creating added value. It's all about increasing regional or national wealth, improving living standards of its citizens, and sustainability. These are the key terms in terms uh, for competitive advantage of a region or a nation using its resources productively. We often hear comparative advantage and competitive advantage. People often are confused with these terms. Comparative advantage is all about what resources you have in a region, in a country. Competitive advantage is all about how you use your resources, these resources. There are many countries very, very rich in terms of oil, mines, natural resources, but yet still not competitive, not developed. But on the other hand, you have, there are countries like Japan, Singapore, some of the Scandinavian countries, yet they have absolutely limited resources, national, uh, natural resources, mines, oils, but they are the most competitive countries. So it's all about how you use, deploy your resources and achieve competitive advantage. But in classes when we discuss competitive advantage of a, a nation or a region, first we, dis we must discuss and explain firm level competitive advantage at organization level, how firms compete. Obviously, there are three competing and conflicting uh, views about how firms, organizations can uh, create and maintain competitive advantage. I will be very quick to go through. One is positioning view, very famous Porter keeps saying, uh, you must look outside the external environment and choose one position. Either you are the cost leader or you differentiate or you, you focus in a niche area. Again and again, yes, 
there are some companies followed one type of this strategy, but there are many examples that companies can follow all three together. Mr. Rosen's hotel follow these two or, or all to, uh, three of them together and yet successful. And resource-based view, they say, don't look outside too much, look inside what you have, what is rare about you, your resources, what is valuable, what is rare, what others cannot copy and substitute. Look what unique resources, competencies you have and focus on them. If you look at Disney, all those successful companies, Disney, Apple, Southwest Airlines, they have uh, com uh, distinctive competencies, they have something that, <coughs> excuse me, valuable, rare, and they have com competencies that other companies cannot imitate. The third one is more recent, uh, well accepted, is dynamic capabilities. We, it's all about when companies create competitive advantage, they have to manage their knowledge, internal knowledge. They need to create synergies among different departments, functional levels, and they need to be innovative, come up with products and services, yet they must be the first in the market, keep innovating, keep innovating. It's no good if you were the best last year, but you should be the first and best company offer the best products. So for regional competitiveness, we must understand that firms in a region must compete well and offer uh, world-class products and services to be able to uh, create a national or regional competitive advantage. We often talk about Porter's diamond model. I'm sorry, these are rather theoretical but very important concepts. Uh, there are six factors. One is factor conditions. I'm sure South Africa and this uh, municipality is very uh, rich in terms of resources, uh, natural, uh, natural resources, but in terms of input factors, cost of electricity, availability of water, employment, uh, uh, availability of finance, these are important factors, factor conditions. And demand conditions, yes, this morning some, uh, one of uh, the attendees asked a question in terms of demand for a theme park. Yes, we need a local demand, domestic demand for any industry, for any organization to, uh, to be successful. Yeah. Plus, after that, yes, international or demand from other countries is, is very important. When they talk about why Japanese companies and electronic uh, organizations and firms have been successful, because domestic demand in Japan have been very, very uh, strong for those industries. That's why they have been successful. Then we move to uh, firms. They compete based on uh, quality, innovative uh, products and services. And then you have supporting industries for any uh, industry, so they work together. Then you need to have government support uh, to have a competitive advantage for an industry. Finally, chance or bad luck. Sometimes there is a disaster, there is a crisis, it affects negatively the whole industry. Sometimes a crisis in, a, in another country can uh, impact your uh, your industry, and then you can be very, very lucky. So the cluster concept is, uh, has been around for the last 20, 25 years, basically. Uh, it's all about group of businesses and institutions co-located in a specific uh, geographic location, region, and they are linked by interdependencies in providing a related, of, a related group of products and services. We all talk about commonalities and complementaries. So they uh, support each other and there are similarities. They compete, they cooperate. Clusters develop over a period of time and you must have a, there must be a strong business environment. Uh, sometimes a larger corporation may initiate, may dominate. In some cities, for example, in US universities, a uh, university started the clustering pr uh, process. Uh, but you still need network of small and medium-sized companies. And you need to have public and private partnerships to be able to create uh, clusters. Yet, there should be trust and cooperation between organizations, trust between the government and the private industry. 
I won't go into detail, but there are some preconditions uh, in terms of cluster, uh, development of clusters. For example, proximity. Uh, you need to have entrepreneurs in the region. There must be some firms, a critical mass of firms. Dean Pizan mentioned infrastructure. A university research institutions and trust building and partnership building initiatives between the government and private uh, organizations. And after you create or work on clusters, uh, you have benefits, some measures. You, incre you have increased productivity. You specialize, the region specializes in one area. You have innovation and employment benefits, what we mean more employ, uh, more jobs, higher paid, higher skills, and new businesses are formed, and from all these businesses, information, knowledge, experience, all spill over with each other, they are connected, and then you establish partnership and trust. Then you have competitiveness here. I've been asked, I have only two minutes, I will be fast, so I, but I will be happy to answer questions. This is a simple yet complicated example, a figure of a cluster for a tourism industry. You have a tourism product, but lodging, tour operators, restaurants, entertainment, trading, they're all connected and work together, support each other. But also you need, you need government support, unions, tourists, federations, associations, universities, and yet it's also linked with other clusters, so they support uh, each other and they are linked. And without having some of these, you cannot have a strong cluster. Let me summarize and finish with some uh, questions and then we can have further discussions. You need to have a strong business environment, strong competition, you need to have entrepreneurship culture, you need to have entrepreneurs in the region so they can create uh, comp successful companies. And you need to create synergies, bridges between among clusters. You need to have partnership and trust and you need to facilitate support innovation. Finally, sustainability in a region. It's not a short-term competitive advantage, but your competitive advantage in a region should be sustainable for long term. And all these e efforts, investments, overall goal is to improve quality of living of its citizens in, one, in the region. Income, employment, and education, a, a, a higher and better living standards. So I stop here with these questions, and then I'm sure there will be qu uh, discussions about it. Which clusters exi exist in this municipality? Which clusters should be further developed? How can existing clusters be better strengthened? How can existing and future clusters be better linked? What should be the role of local government? And what should be the role of private sector? and what should be the role of universities and other organizations. If this municipality wants to create clusters or discuss or work on uh, developing further clusters, perhaps some of these questions and answering these questions can help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fevzi, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we are really pressed for time, so I had to tell him uh, uh, to finish this sooner. He did it in seven minutes. If you wish, he can do it in seven hours or 70 days for you. Just invite him back, and he's totally at your service. Uh, he did talk about clustering. We have to decluster a little bit uh, in order to get to the finer points of the discussion. Um, may I invite the panel to suggest if they have any further comments to make on the infrastructure? I think we could place uh, uh, FEVZ's idea in the second category. Uh, any comments fr uh, from un uh, item number one and two? If not, we move on. Okay. Perhaps in number one, and uh, based on also what uh, uh, who was commented on the table uh, before. Um, I think it's important to depart from what, who we are. This isn't the first question, who we are. And who we are means examining really what we have in Bombela. 
What do we have here? What sort of natural poten potentials we have? What sort of cultural potentials we have? Uh, also, uh, what, how can we compete with other destinations? In which aspects we are unique and how we are going to position ourselves? I think the first question is to examine all that. What is our reality, infrastructure and superstructure? To see in which ways we have a comparative advantage and in which ways we can build our positioning. Finalize. It is not enough to say we think tourism is a good idea and we can develop an activity in tourism. You have to decide within tourism, what are you going to do? Tourism is widespread all over the world. Everyone thinks tourism is wonderful and everything, everyone thinks tourism is a way to development. In which way is Bombela unique? Where are you going to position yourselves? And to do that, you have to examine your infrastructure capacities, what you can do with that, and your superstructural capacities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just one additional comment. I agree 100%. Uh, you established a brand. Currently, the problem of South Africa internationally, it is not an established brand. When you think of South Africa, what comes into your mind? We don't know. And most people don't know. When you think of Mombela, what comes into your mind? That has to be established before anything else. Because you have to distinguish yourself in terms of position from anybody else. So when you say Coke, it's Coca-Cola. It's not Coke. That comes into one's mind. When you say rent a car, it's Hertz or Avis. That comes into your mind. You have to establish a brand that will be superior to many others. Thank you. Uh, and of course, if you have questions, you can jot down the questions. And later on, at the end of the session, we may return to as much as time permits. I would like to move to entrepreneurship. Some of us teach entrepreneurship, and some of us practice. So we go to the gentleman among us who practices entrepreneurship. And just uh, speaking from your heart, uh, just the way it goes. When uh, Fevzi described what professors do, he was right on. <laughs> Those of us who work in the private sector and, and consider ourselves to be uh, entrepreneurs, um, and that is something that I don't think you can teach. I don't think you can teach someone to be six foot eight. I don't think you can teach someone to be an entrepreneur. It is a gene, and some of you have this gene, and it's not a very good gene. It's a defective gene. It makes you do things that others would say are stupid, that don't follow the beautiful graph that Fevzi described. You might do things without even knowing there's such a graph. You might not even care if there's a graph. You do what this horrible little gene tells you to do, because that's who you are. You have a dream. You want to follow that dream. And I'm not suggesting that all of these things are unimportant or irrelevant. They are important. But as I said, Walt Disney wasn't looking at a chart. He was looking at his heart. And that's the most important thing. When I left Disney in 1973, I might add involuntarily, <laughs> I was told by my boss's boss, I was expecting a raise. I was told by him that I've done a beautiful job, but I would never become a Disney person. And I thought about that for a little bit, and then my response was, is it because my ears are too small? Now, I don't want to offend anyone, but the person who I mentioned that to said, that's the kind of, can I use this word, bullshit that we're talking about. 
I apologize for that. And that was my last day at Disney. I'm fired because I didn't respect a rodent. But I had a dream. I think my dream was to one day own a little hotel. That was my dream. And some of you may remember in 1974, there was an oil embargo, a terrible embargo. And virtually every hotel in Orlando was facing foreclosure or bankruptcy or in serious financial difficulty. And that's when this genius decided it was the right time to buy a hotel because I knew I could afford one during those difficult times. And I bought one for $20,000, which was all the money that I had. I didn't have any money. When I walked into what was my office, the evening after I purchased the hotel, on June 24th, 1974, I cried. Because I said it was the dumbest thing I had ever done in my life. <laughs> I knew where my market was, the motor coach market, the bus market, bringing people down, even during the time when gasoline was dear. But I couldn't, I couldn't travel to where the bus companies were. So I said to myself, I have a thumb. And I hitchhiked all the way to Massachusetts from Orlando. And when I got there, I made appointments with the bus company owners who heard my story and were really terribly surprised that someone would do what I did. And they were very receptive to my story. I didn't have anything with me. I didn't have any contracts. I had little business cards. And I would ask them to write a room rate on the business card that they were happy paying. I said, whatever that rate is, I don't care and I would sign my name and said, I'll send you a letter after. I collected five cards. The room rates averaged from $7.50 to $8.50 per room, per night, up to four people in the room. I was fortunate that one of the owners had a friend who was driving to Orlando and that's how I got back. It was probably the dumbest decision I could have made I didn't have the benefit of experts and consultants and professors. <laughs> and the point I'm making is that sometimes people like me and some of you do things that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. And if we work hard and we're honest and we respect others, Miracles do happen. And so that's a message I just want to give you under the heading of entrepreneurship. You are not blessed having this gene. Please understand that. It will make you do things that normal people will not even think about doing. But don't let that hold you back, okay? Thank you. And decoding uh, entrepreneurship, of course, you need to take risk, and you did take risk, uh, Harris. And you have to be innovative, and you were innovative with what you did. Uh, these are some of the characteristics of uh, entrepreneurship. Any other colleagues who would like to comment on this? I would like to comment on the virtues of uh, dreaming and the dangers of dreaming. I think. I think I, I know more than a hundred dreamers like Mr. Rosen, and I know one who has succeeded, which is Mr. Rosen. So I would say with Mr. Rosen, if you want to take your chances, follow exactly what Mr. Rosen said. You don't, need, you don't need academicians, you don't need much study, you can just go on your own initiative and luck be with you. Uh, but I know many people who uh, have that way and have not had your luck. So I'll say that uh, 
follow your dream and then do work hard. And that means understanding, analyzing, getting the best advice you, you, you can to get your chances improved. Hmm? So that uh, even if you have the gene of entrepreneurship, you might need to do some study. And I'm going with that to point number four, where I think that is essential. Because we don't want politicians improvising and we don't want politicians following their own dreams only. Politicians is my understanding, and I serve politicians, and I have served, I've been in governments uh, quite a few times in my life. I think that is a quite dangerous thing. I think politicians are there to serve the community and not to serve their own dreams only. only. It's good to have politicians who are leaders, but that has certain dangers, and in history we have seen that, those dangers. So my advice in the 21st century is do your homework. Do get as much knowledge as you can. Do get the best advice that you can. And then, yes, and then go ahead in knowing what you're doing. Take the best decision you can take. But uh, do get the advice. And in the case of politics, not only advice. You're there in politics, and we are here in politics to serve the community. So my lemma, point 10 and a half, is thinking, and I think thinking is very important, thinking together, and then, and only then, acting together. And especially important in the politics, Mombela municipality, Mupalanga province, and South Africa and other countries. Thank you. About entrepreneurship, uh, I would like to make a few comments. Mr. Rosen may not be happy uh, what I'm going to say, but let me summarize. When you really look at uh, his resume, background, experience, he was well trained to be an entrepreneur. Uh, he, had, he, he was in the army for several years. He, fin he had a degree in hospitality management from Cornell. He had an MBA, he worked for hotel companies, uh, he worked for Disney, although they let him go and did him a big favor. So he was well prepared. My point is, yes, you may have this defective gene, you may, be, you may have inherited this gene to be an entrepreneur, but you need some training, you need some education. And there are pro uh, programs uh, offered by universities, by uh, governments, by municipalities to prepare uh, and train future entrepreneurs in terms of business plan, in terms of financial statements, in terms of applying for a loan, getting a, a, a loan. So if these programs are offered, how to set up a business, how you can apply for a loan, how you can uh, market your product, how you can merge with, with another company, how you can contact with, uh, other companies. So there are uh, training programs and there are uh, opportunities if you have cre all these creative ideas. I believe you know, training uh, is really, really important. Plus, if you, have, if you are gifted with this gene, it will be perfect uh, supplementing with uh, additional training and experience. Thank you. Uh, surprisingly, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Are we discussing number four for a little bit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Orlando, Orange County, citrus trees. Walt Disney comes, God bless him, and builds this most spectacular attraction. People start coming to Orlando, tourists, the leisure market, the leisure market. And I go from one hotel to two hotels, to three hotels, to four hotels. I'm going crazy and the hotels are running occupancies between 95 and 100 percent and I am so happy. Now this gene talks to me and says how could you be happy? There's a whole other market out there. What is that market? It's the meeting market. Oh, but Orlando is a tourist destination for leisure travelers. No, 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 no. You can be a great meeting market also. 
Please stop talking to me, you're confusing me. So a few of us got together and we spoke to our Orange County Administrator and the County Commissioners and we said, we have an idea. The idea is that we can expand our tourist space by including meetings. What do you need for the meetings? We need a convention center. How will you pay for it? Taxes. You may tax us and generate revenue and pay back the loan. But we're not sure that people in Orange County would appreciate that. Let's ask them. Let's have a vote. And so we had a vote, a referendum, and it passed. So now Orange County voters said, you hotel people can tax yourselves and we will build a convention center, even though it's going to mean more traffic, but it'll also mean more jobs, more opportunities. So we built a convention center. And then we had to build hotels. Now, the company that owned the land and donated the land to the county was back then Martin Marietta, the now Lockheed Martin, a very, very big company in the United States. And because I was so instrumental in having the referendum passed, when I asked them if I could buy a piece of property near the convention center, I assumed they would say, absolutely. But they said, are you kidding? Your name is Rosen, no, not Hilton, not Marriott, not Hyatt, not Wyndham, not Fairmont. We want a big name. I was hurt. And I said, well, that's the end of the opportunity for me. About nine months went by and no announcements. And then I get a phone call from the president of the subsidiary of Martin Merida in Orlando. Harris, we're closing our books in two weeks. Do you still want to buy a piece of property? I said, oh my God, right next to the convention center. How much is it? It's $8 million. Oh, when do you need it by? Tomorrow. <laughs> oh, are you interested? I'll be there with a check. We had some money in the bank. I wrote out a check for $9 million. I went to his office. I don't think you know this story. I went to his office and I asked the receptionist, can I see Mr. Brown? I have something for him. Well, he's busy right now, but I'll ask. She came back and said, no, he's too busy. I said, I have something for him. She said, what is it? I said, it's a check. You can leave it here. <laughs> it's for a lot of money. He said, leave it here. Now, I left the check there. It was fine. I bought the property. And I asked Jim Brown, what was wrong? Why would you come out? He said, I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell you, but I had all of the top guys from the company visiting and you know you're not a famous name and you don't look like you're very important <laughs> and I was embarrassed if they would see you and I would tell them that he's the guy that bought that prime piece of property right next to the convention center <laughs> so look you will have your obstacles. You will stumble on the way. You will be terribly disappointed. And the point is, never give up. As it turns out, <laughs> as it turns out, as strange as it may seem, the big guys wanted nothing to do with the meeting market in Orlando. They were convinced it would never work. So who wound up? with hotels on either side of the convention center? Rosen. Rosen Center? Rosen Plaza. Because I believed I had faith and I had a dream.
One thing Mr. Rosen forgot. <laughs> that before he opened his first convention hotel, he came to Rosen College of Hospitality Management and he said, I know nothing about convention hotels. I've been operating leisure properties. Could we have a study done on how convention hotels are run? And guess our college with our students, that particular study and was done and handed over. So knowledge is important and he admits that. And it has a place in the annals of tourism development, which moves us to the next topic. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> well, we got another ingredient for, uh, uh, for being entrepreneur uh, besides perseverance, ideas, dreams, etc. Uh, when it gets tough, the tough gets going. And, uh, an entrepreneur doesn't give up uh, until the right solution is found. Thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing your experience and the rough road on which you have traveled and you have reached the destination and you have surpassed it. And we need to manage our time a bit more efficiently because uh, I think there is lunch, uh, but we have food for thought. Would you like to make a selection of them? I know we have half an hour, we have six items left. All right, very good. So let's, uh, I, I, I take it that we are all done with number four, uh, knowledge management. Any colleague who would like to comment on that? Thank you, Jafar. I think uh, Mr. Roshan is uh, very correct on one thing. Um, in saying that sometimes uh, the world of knowledge is too theoretical and too far apart from the world of practice. We in the Ulysses Foundation, where Jafar is also a trustee member, we have come with the idea of bridging theory and practice, and I think that is essential. So when I say that knowledge has to be present when we make decisions, and I think that is almost obvious, I, I also think that that knowledge has to be accessible to the decision makers. And it is true that in many universities, in many centers of thinking in the world, they are a little bit apart from reality, and especially very little, uh, a little bit apart from the realities of tourism. And that's a bad, very bad idea. I think we in tourism should be pushing for knowledge close to us, and I think Mr. Roshan has done, as Professor Pisan has just reminded him, although Mr. Roshan does not remember. <laughs> but I think that we should be pushing in that direction. I have been very much concerned in the United Nations World Tourism Organization there was a wealth of knowledge in many institutions, in many universities all over the world. Also here, I've been working with universities in South Africa, Cape Town, Pretoria, Johannesburg. And, and uh, I think there is a wealth of knowledge that should be more accessible to the practitioners. So I think one thing that we have to be present is how to bridge that theory, that knowledge that is in practice. How we making decisions have to influence knowledge and how also those dedicating their lives and, and professions to thinking should also uh, 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 be closer to us. Thank you. Uh, relating to knowledge management and education and training, uh, let's use the example of a Disney World or Universal or any other theme park uh, that is built around the world. It is a very complex business. It's a business that requires multiple disciplines. It's a business that requires precise work. It is not something that you can come up by yourself from your own limited knowledge. You need to employ experts. You need to select them. You need to train your employees within those fields of expertise. Whether it's the safety and security of the rides, or whether it is the food and beverage, or whether it's the customer service, all these do not appear from the air. Somebody needs to impart the knowledge, the skills, and most importantly, the service attitude to these employees. So therefore, knowledge education and training 
are unnecessary but insufficient requirement of any tourist destination. You cannot avoid that. That is a prime requirement and it should be emphasized from day one. When we discuss a uh, competitive advantage, uh, for example, Disney, Southwest Airlines, Apple, it is not what they offer. Their competitive advantage in most cases is not their products, but their culture, organizational culture, how they operate. They have done studies after studies uh, on Southwest Airlines. It's a airline company in the U.S. has been very, very successful. For the last 35 years has been profitable. All other companies, uh, airlines have faced financial challenges, but this company has been very, very successful. One thing they do really well, they fly from one point to another, very cheap, no seats assigned, uh, very reliable. Again and again, their competitive advantage, they say, is not their planes, it's their, it's their service, how they treat their guests, uh, their uh, passengers, and their organization culture. Employees who work for Southwest Airlines, they're very happy. They share their knowledge with, with, each, uh, with each other, and they support. And the company, all, if you look at all successful companies, they focus on training, education, and commitment, so talent management. Uh, when you travel from one point to another destination, you don't want to have any challenges, any obstacles. How you maintain that? One element is physical elements. The hotel room, you know, the, the uh, flight, the restaurant, physical elements. But main service is provided by employees. How you, maintain, how you ensure that your employees provide the best service. It's all about education and training. So if a destination needs to be competitive, all frontline employees and managers need to be tr really, really trained well and committed. One thing I like about here, South Africa, a big smile, a genuine smile, a good handshake. In most cases, well-delivered service and products, but it has to be consistent from the airport to the restaurant to the hotel all the way. One thing is Orlando is very, very successful. You arrive at the airport, from the airport to the hotel, to the restaurant, to the theme parks, all consistent, good service, genuine service, and it makes a huge, huge difference. Thank you. Please. Uh, the next topic is uh, quality standards. As Fezzi started saying, and I will quote a very well-known saying, that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. In the chain of tourism, you cannot have weak links because a tourist who experiences a poor service or poor quality product in one single establishment within the destination may get upset and never visit that destination again. Therefore, the establishment of uniform quality of standards for everyone at the destination is of great importance. One of the great successes of the Disney Corporation, and by the way, they don't pay me for saying all those great things about Disney, is they have uniform quality standards that are enforced throughout the company. An employee who is asked a particular question by a particular guest or asked to do a particular act, that employee has a script he or she does not have the authority to move away from that script because that script is developed in the main office as a quality standard of reply. And when Mr. Rosen, which he hopefully will tell you, does his inspection of his hotel, everybody knows 
that he will go about the top of the door, move his finger around, look for the dust, and if he finds that dust, he will put it in the face of employee and ask, what is it? And when he comes to our college and he collects the cigarette butts from the parking lot and he brings them to my table and puts them on my desk, he reminds me that is a quality standard. And I have to enforce it, whether I like it or not. So the importance of establishing quality standards and enforcing them uniformly throughout the destination is a great importance as well. Yes, I, I do do that, and I, I apologize, Dean Pizan. I, I, I didn't know we had passed education and training, so I, I apologize for that. But I tease a, a bit about education perhaps not being as important as it is. It is really critical. And I remember one day, not too long ago, when Dr. Bazam came to visit with me at one of the hotels, and we had lunch together. And he shared with me that he, he wasn't as, as happy as he expected to be in Orlando as the dean of the hospitality school. It was then a part of the University of Central Florida and a part of the business school. And to be quite candid, the hospitality school was, was not being treated very fairly. It, it, um, it, it was not receiving the kind of attention it should. And one of the great destinations, great hospitality destinations, this poor little school, school had 75 to 100 students and was neglected. And I don't know what prompted me to say this, but I said, Abe, one day, please stay, because one day I will help build you a new college. And so, see, for me, even back then, education was really critical. And we did what we promised. We donated 20 acres of prime property, and we gave another check and helped design and, and build what is now perhaps one of the most outstanding hospitality colleges in, in, the in the world. And the number of students has grown from about 75 to about 3,500 one of the fastest growing colleges anywhere. And so I kid a, a lot about education. Now, three of my four children happen to be at Rosen College. They tell me they really have a very keen interest in the hospitality business. I think they're being more clever than they are honest. But <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. And of course, training is also critical. Um, your associates need to be trained well. This, this, this level of service is essential, and it must be standardized. But, but let me share this with you. You can have a wonderful training program. You can have associates who are well-trained and well-educated. But if you don't treat them well, all of that goes into the toilet. So I suspect that our little company might have, and you guys keep me honest, one of the best benefits programs in the world. Let me give you an example. We have our own medical center, three full-time doctors, a staff of 28. They take care of all of my associates and their dependents and the youngsters at Rosen College. If you work for me, your family, yourself, you get sick and you're in the hospital, the most that you pay is $500, I pay the balance. And I shared with some of you a story. We had a little 14 ounce preemie born last year. The mom was very sick, the baby was very sick. After four or five months, they both left the hospital in great shape. The bill, $1,300,000. The family paid $500. Rosen paid the balance. And when you combine training 
with a wonderful benefits program because you respect your associates. You have the best of all worlds. I suspect also that Rosen Hotels, which has about 4,000 associates, may have the lowest turnover of any company in the hospitality industry in the world. We turn over single digits. The hospitality industry sadly turns over anywhere from maybe 50% to 200%. So it's a package. It's great training, it's respect, it's wonderful benefits, and you'll have associates who are loyal and hardworking and provide the quality of service that you want for your guests. Going also in point number seven, quality standards. Uh, it is perhaps likely that many of you will think that quality standards are a nuisance and are a bit uh, bureaucratic and that uh, they, uh, in some, some cases, do not facilitate your business. But I like to take the viewpoint of the opposite. We are going to move in a world where there will be increasing quality standards. Uh, let me give you an example in food and agriculture. Anyone who wants now to do agricultural business has to go by the standards of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. You cannot cultivate food for export or for trade unless you go with those standards. Now, it is true that in tourism, we have lived for many years in a rather unregulated uh, uh, business. But we have seen that from the viewpoint of security and safety, the standards have been increasing. Sometimes, perhaps, some of us may think too much. Um, and I, I believe that those standards are going to grow. My advice for a place like Bombella is that you should be not only accepting standards coming from outside, but also very much involved in the discussion that is going to happen about the standards. I'll give you one example. Ten years ago, we had a meeting in Arusha, in Tanzania, about how to run what were the standards for national parks. And to that meeting, of course, Kruger National Park came, and of course, Serengeti came. And there was a big discussion about which park was run best, because Serengeti has many animals and has the wildebeest migration, well, what Kruger had. And I was absolutely surprised at the professionality of Kruger. In fact, Kruger won for one reason, because as it was said here, Kruger knew, as Disney has been said, knew how to go about things. They had processes, they have approved ways to go about things. While Serengeti, while being a wonderful place and everyone working there had a good heart, did not have those processes established. My advice about quality standards is that you, have, you, will, be, you will be in the middle of them, you will have to go by them, and it is very interesting to be involved in the discussion. As we are planning, and you know very well, that next year, 2030, 2030, may be a very important year for Africa in general, for the United Nations in tourism, for the United Nations World Tourism Organization. We are planning things here. The General Assembly of the United Nations Tourism will happen in Africa next year. And of course, Mbombela is thinking about having important events related to that, and perhaps to have the best part of that, which will be content. My, my advice is that we should be together beginning to think about what standards, uh, how you are going to take part in those discussions, and especially concerning things like the resources you have. Thank you. We are moving along all right. Uh, I, of course, we have ten items, but I'm sure you recognize they're all interconnected. We just separate them for the purpose of discussion, like uh, um, quality of service and, and the like are also part of the body of knowledge that are taught, that are, uh, people are educated, there are trainings on it. But there is a problem. The problem is that we have a body of knowledge on one side and a body of practice on the other side. And these two streams are not quite connected. And I think this is something that you want to, to see how much this is true in South Africa and in the region here? And what would be the ways that the knowledge can come to the aid of practice and how practice can inform knowledge? It, they have to become one, and this has not happened. 
With this point made, uh, we move on to the uh, next item, which is very much connected to what we're talking about, and that is the spirit of hospitality. Uh, the attitude, uh, the willingness to receive people, accommodate people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, as I mentioned in my very uh, beginning, not just the hotel people and air, airport people and so on and so that's part of their duty. The community needs to accept the same responsibility. How can we encourage the community to become a host community, a receptive community, a community which is willing to provide, accommodate tourists, receive tourists with pride and pleasure, not just with sim 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 uh, simple smile? So I would like to have, invite my colleagues to comment on the spirit of hospitality. Of course, uh, Dr. Pizam has a definition for hospitality from production point of view, hotel, etc. But then we have the notion of spirit of hospitality. Right. If you examine the ratings of airlines in the world, if you examine the ratings of the best hotel in the world, you will quickly come to the conclusion that the best airlines, the best hotels in the world are in the Far East. They are not in North America. They are not in Africa, they are not in Asia or Europe, they are in the Far East. They fly the same airline, they, the same aircraft. They have the same organizational structure. They, their pilots are trained in the same way. But what distinguishes Singapore Airlines or Thai Pacific from Lufthansa, United Airlines or Delta is the spirit of hospitality. Why are these different than others? Because the spirit of hospitality is the attitude of the employees in serving the customers. Something that is difficult to teach, even from the Swiss Air, who pride itself on the different uh, organizational structure, that they know how to serve customers, but Swiss airline or hoteliers do not have the same natural spirit of hospitality than Thai or Indonesians or Koreans. So the spirit of hospitality that luckily exists in Africa, exists in South Africa, is very much almost like a natural resource that if properly trained can lead South Africa to become one of the most satisfactory tourist destination from a customer point of view. When we define hospitality, there are different definitions. The basic is providing shelter, food, security, safety, and so forth. In, for the last 10 years, how we define hospitality is offering, uh, providing memorable, positive experiences. It's all about going home with positive, memorable experiences that you will not forget. Some experiences can be really negative, but some, all experiences, if you're traveling as a tourist, should be positive. There may be some small experiences, but maybe peak experiences. But when you put all together, when you look at your photos, when you see the hotel, you remember, oh, we had this dinner here, we, we had this lunch. When you look at one photo, you remember the cave you, we went in and all these experiences. So hospitality is all about providing positive experiences. For this, going, we need to go back again, education, training, and physical facilities, providing memorable experiences. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. You, um, this, this all connects to unique selling proposition that we talked about earlier. What is so unique about Mombella region or for South Africa? In the case of Mombella, you have one of your unique selling proposition is the uh, Kruger part for sure. But how about making hospitality one of your unique selling propositions? So you stand out in the experience that uh, he's talking about. People take good experience with them, and you're known as a service, a standard quality destination. You're luckier than Disney. Disney has to constantly reinvent 
Disney World. You don't have to reinvent Kruger Park. That one is always is a selling unique proposition. Can you just imagine the difference between the two strategies? Leave Kruger Park alone. But Imagineers in Disney constantly have to revise and come up with new ideas. So you have that fantastic there, fantastic attraction, unique sell selling proposition there. The country has it. I think th the idea that we are advancing here and parking with you is uh, what can South Africa do to enhance its image also in the area of service standards and hospitality. Moving on to uh, safety and security, uh, a topic that some people don't want to talk about, but we cannot. We have to talk about it, whether we believe it, uh, the country is safe or not. If tourists believe the country is not safe, but we think it is safe, that would not go. So I would like to invite my colleagues to comment on safety and security. Oh, <laughs> first. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, in warm destinations, uh, there was always a saying uh, that a warm destination have to provide the three S's. They were sun, sea, and sand. I'm sorry to tell you that today a warm destination have to have six S's. And they are sun, sea, sand, sex, safety, and security. <laughs> <laughs> Seven. Sorry. Uh, he corrects me that we have to provide sangria as well. <laughs> now, more seriously, in today's world, any destination that cannot assure its potential and existing tourist of a reasonable measure of safety and security will fail. A tourist wants to go away from his home, but wants to have the same amenities and the same feelings about personal safety and security, at least that he has at home. Nobody wants, or very few people, want to be faced with terrorism, with war, with civil unrest, with strikes, with unsafe environments that can lead to fires or even natural disasters like hurricanes, like earthquake, and so on and so forth. So the provision of safe and secure environment is mandatory. And unless you provide it or assure the tourists in advance that this will happen, they will not come. Now, I know realistically speaking, there is no 100% safe and secure destination. We all have some problems, some with crime, some with terrorism, some with natural disasters, and so forth. But it is our responsibility as tourism operators to try to the best that we can to prevent those from occurring, or when they do occur, to be honest with the tourist, to admit what's wrong, and to take any measure to ameliorate the situation post, uh, you know, event. So I cannot emphasize more than I do the importance of safety and security for any destination in any country. I like I like to stay by what Professor Pisham has said, but there is a, an additional question, which is how how you do that, because I think many of us would agree perfectly well with what you said, but the issue is how do you go about that? Let me remember a, a past occasion. This was in '91, when the U.S. the U.S. had a problem with crime in Florida, precisely in your, in your area. Many tourists were killed. And at the same time, Spain was facing the Olympics and the World Expo, the Olympics in Barcelona and the World Expo, with terrible problems in terrorism. You know that Spain has had many problems with terrorism. And some of you may ask, how do you manage? How do you put those things together? How do you get, how do you get to 57 million tourists in Spain, international tourists in Spain, and another uh, 30 million domestic, uh, with terrorism in the country going at the same time? 
And I think that requires very professional management. At that time, I, I was meeting with my colleagues in the US. I was in charge of tourism in Spain. I was meeting with some of the colleagues in the US in the context of the uh, UNWTO. And we're thinking how to do about that. And I think you have to solve the problem of safety and security without hurting the quality of the experience. And I think that if you overdo, you might hurt it very well. And if you underdo, you're out of business. So how to keep that balance and how to act professionally is quite, quite something to achieve. Uh, you are 100% right. And let me give you an example how you don't do it. You don't do it by putting a police person in every single corner because by doing that, which Puerto Rico, by the way, has done it, you scare the tourists. <laughs> Not only did they do that, but they put the police persons in a Kevlar vest when the Kevlar vest took out. So everybody saw that the police is scared of the terrorists. <laughs> so you don't do that. You do it by, very simple, making every employee in the hotels, restaurants, and attraction a safety and security employee by having additional eye, by making the community aware that this is a problem that they have to watch for, that everyone has a stake in the well-being of the tourists, and they have the responsibility to try to prevent it. When they see it, point it, call the police, point it out, and when somebody gets hurt, please go and help. Show that you care. Now, this is a not, not a foolproof solution, but it goes way, way behind the simple matter of having more security and more guns and more, uh, you know, whatever else prevention measures like cameras and so forth, which have proven not to be sufficient. We have to make it short. Uh Well, I, I once again are, am inclined to look at this from a micro perspective. Um, uh, clearly, uh, a destination has to be safe and secure, and not too many police, certainly not police with their vest and a shotgun. I understand that. But you know the hotel has to be secure also. The, 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 the restaurant has to be secure. The attraction has to be secure. At least give the perception of security, and, and that's training. And we have a saying that all of our associates are aware of when they go through their orientation. The saying is, safety is no accident. So you have to work hard to create a safe environment. You have to make sure that your guests are well taken care of. And we have a whole department called risk management. And we emphasize, emphasize safety and security. Thank you very much. Uh, I, we are really running out of time, but I just want to make this point that safety and security in the mind of the tourist is the same thing. You know, in both cases means the destination is not uh, terrorism. Safety and security is the same thing in the mind of tourists. Uh, lack of security and terrorism are identical for, in the mind of the tourists. And I want my students to remember this, and I came up with a uh, nice phrase of, uh, stolen from hotel industry hotel business, and that's how I, I tell them. As soon as terrorism checks in, tourism checks out. And as soon as terrorism checks out, tourism checks in. It's that absolute relationship that you can see. I think everybody needs to remember the commitment, uh, that the relationship, and indeed we are a peace-loving uh, industry by definition. Uh, if, I, if I may have only two or three minutes uh, comments on number ten, 10 and we are done. Who would like to talk? Um, I would like to put number 10 and 10 and a half together. Because quality of life in the 21st century is going to depend on two things. It is going to depend on thinking and acting correctly. And no acting is going to be correct without thinking. This is the century of knowledge. We are in a globalized world where many people are thinking hard to be best at something. So if we want to be best at something, we will have to think hard, so knowledge is going to become essential. In my opinion, any community, and in Bombella will be one, 
that wants to have good quality of life and good standard of life will have to think hard. Mm -hmm. But then it's not enough to think hard. You have to act together. So the big problem that we have in the world in governance, not in tourism in general, I think is exploring what is best for us and then agreeing together and doing that. Mm -hmm. And if we do that in tourism, that means success. I think communities have success when they get together under a good banner, under a good strategy, they want to perform. And if they have very good ideas, but they don't act together, it will not happen. If they act together without good ideas, good luck. Very shortly. Uh, employees in the tourism industry work under difficult conditions. They work shifts, days, and nights, holidays. They work standing on their feet. Many of them, not all of them, work an unskilled occupation, standing, you know, under heat and all other conditions. So it's a tough job while the tourists that they serve is having the greatest time of their life, drinking and eating things that the employees cannot afford. So there is a conflict built in between the employee and the industry, between the employee and the tourist. So great men like Mr. Rosen provide a quality of life which is decent and almost equitable to those of the tourists. And therefore, they do not have to face the daily conflict of, wow, I can't even afford to buy once a month the steak that he eats three times a week or four times a week in this hotel. So the provision of a decent quality of life, I believe personally, and learn from his own experience, it is a necessary condition for successful operation. Yes, I agree with uh, everything that Dr. Bazan has, has just said. Um, and our little company is a little bit different because it's not part of a large corporation, it's more of a family. And we get to know our associates very well, and they become part of the family. When they want to stay in one of our properties or eat in one of our properties, we provide them with a special rate called friends and family. It's a minimum of 50% off, and we do that. So much do we appreciate their hard work. I do want to have one final comment. You live in the most incredible place. It's amazing. We have all been blown away by what we have seen and the warm and gracious hospitality that you provided. Amazing. And so I've been thinking, if indeed, because I think it's going to happen, if indeed you become a great tourist destination, both for leisure travelers and meeting travelers. It's going to happen. Mark my words, it will happen. Wouldn't it be lovely, as part of your marketing and advertising campaign, you would say, let's meet in heaven. God bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, we also intended to talk about corporate social responsibility, but in more than one way, uh, Mr. Harris uh, uh, Rosen has told us about corporate social responsibility that he has given back to the community. So we can skip that part. Uh, Matilda, I know that you were holding up the, uh, the sign, uh, but I have bad eye. I can't see even your numbers. So I think she was telling me that I have one more hour or something like that. <laughs> But I did promise that you ask them questions. We ask our own questions. We answered our own questions. Now I would like at least um, maybe two, may I? A uh, couple of questions. You ask your questions, we give our answers. But what is important at the, end, at the conclusion of this, uh, this uh, panel session that you ask your questions and you answer your questions. 
Anybody? Just two questions. Maybe we can go. I conclude that I we have that answered. They are hungrier than curious here. <laughs> uh, We're not leaving. <laughs> well, that question is definitely the spirit of hospitality that we are talking about, uh, wanting people to, to come back. And indeed, as I told you, this is my second visit, and you have to be satisfied with the destination to become a repeater, obviously. Again, I thank you on behalf of my colleagues uh, who did most of the work. And um, I would like to congratulate all of you for performing the task par excellence. And I'd like to congratulate you for uh, staying at the last minute, showing interest in, in the subject. And we are all uh, in a unified voice convinced that you have a fantastic destination, a fantastic place. And the future is really ahead of you for all, the, all tourism can offer to your destination benefit, not the tourist only, but the stake, other stakeholders, the government, uh, employees of the tourism industry, and the citizen of every host destination. Thank you very much.